So greetings, everybody. This is uh, our cervical spine scenario that we're going to review over the next few minutes. And we'll chat about the when we look at the scenario, what are the important pieces that I kind of glean as I read it? And then we'll go over the, the options. We'll go over the questions and we'll just kind of talk about what information in this scenario led us to the correct choice. We don't have to read all the rationales because you have them there. You can read them, but we just want to highlight the key points. So when we look at this one, the first thing that, that I see is it's a 48 year old female. Um, Anytime an age is given, we want to attend to that age. We want to pay attention to that age because age, obviously certain conditions are more likely with certain ages. So if someone is older versus someone is younger, there might be certain conditions that we're thinking of or that we're not thinking of. So we always pay attention to age. And then we have our chief complaint, right-sided headaches and, and right-sided neck pain. So anytime, obviously, we're given a chief complaint, we want to pay attention to it, especially if it's sided. When we're dealing with the cervical spine or any spine, any spinal question for that matter, the side's going to make a difference because I'm thinking if I'm going to be asked a treatment question, I could be given options of mobilizing a right side versus a left side. So I want to pay attention to what side that pain is on. So that's something that, that I pay attention to. And then we see that she talks about head and she's had them for 10 years. So that's something I want to pay attention to as well. This is, this is not a headache that started a day ago or that started a week ago, because again, there are different conditions I could be thinking of. Someone that says they have a massive acute headache that started one day ago, we could be thinking some cerebrovascular issues or, or cardiopulmonary issues versus this has been for 10 years. So now I'm thinking it's probably a little more mechanical in nature. Um, and again, we have the, the right-sided temporal that she talks about. It talks about frequent bouts of the headaches and it talks about retro orbital, orbital pain. So that's something that's key as well. If we, if we review our headache classifications, <coughs> different headaches present with different symptoms. So cervicogenic versus tension headaches versus migraine headaches. So that piece of information is important to me. Also talks about pain at the base of the skull. That's another piece that's going to be important to me because now I'm starting to think maybe cervicogenic type headaches. So that's kind of what I do as I, as I review this scenario. I start to think of things that might be plausible. I think of things I might be asked, differential diagnosis, intervention questions. And that's kind of the information I think is important. <coughs> she talks about no mechanism of injury. So that's also important. Obviously, if we're given a mechanism of injury, we can think about, okay, which structures are more likely to be injured or what condition is more likely to be present if we have a definitive mechanism of injury. So we always pay attention to that. She talks about being computer data entry. So she's sitting at a desk. So again, that should bring up some thoughts in your head. This is someone that has a sedentary job. So that brings up um, certain issues with the cervical spine and the headaches. Now things start to maybe make a little sense to you. Maybe you're starting to think of a certain diagnosis that's a little more likely than others. So we're starting to form a hypothesis. Um, and then we keep going. We have a pain level so that so obviously we, we know how intense she rates it. We talk about and then, and then we have some observation. So this is this is important as well. Sometimes when I read these scenarios, we can kind of chunk them. So we say the first piece, this is what the patient is reporting, what the patient is presenting. All right, that's very important information. Now we're moving on to the objective examination. Okay, so now these are gonna be physical therapy findings. And that's obviously gonna be important to us as well. So now I just kind of shift my focus a little bit. It talks about postural findings, again, that you can read, gives you all the measurements there. We don't need to review them one by one, but those should mean something to you. And then we talk about accessory joint motion. Again, that's going to mean something to me because I'm thinking if I'm being given accessory joint motion, I'm probably going to be asked a treatment question and intervention is going to depend on this information. So it tells us that we have stiffness on that right side of, of, of C0, C1. So that's something I definitely want to attend to. Um, we talk about palpation. We have some palpation findings. So again, that can very that can be important because we think about when we have a certain area of palpation that's tender. That can be certain structures that are there. That can be certain dysfunctions that might be present. So all that information is, I think, important to attend to. So I like to do these on paper, and I've highlighted this. All the information that I'm discussing with you is information that I highlighted the first time I read through this scenario. And then the last piece that we have, it talks about the patient's goal. That's obviously important as well, because if we're in the clinic, we want to share our patient goals so that we're working toward the same um, the same end. Um, in a scenario, we might be asked, what, what, is a, what is a more appropriate exercise or what's a more appropriate activity? And that might directly relate to what the patient's goal is so or goals are. So we always want to pay attention to that. She just talks about decreasing the headaches so that her neck doesn't feel tired at the end of the day. But that could obviously be information about getting back to a certain sport or activity. And that would be really important because if 
we're asked an intervention question about that, we would want to focus those an activity that that mimics that sport um, or activity. So. If we look at the items here, again, we'll, we'll review them for a few minutes and you, you have the explanations of all the rationales. So the first question is a simple anatomic question. It, it says we have a strong suspicion that we have limited cervical rotation. What level is most likely causing the patient's limited cervical rotation? We were given some cervical rotation measurements. The answer here is going to be C1, C2, and it's because we have a drastic limitation of rotation. We know that we get about half of that rotation from C1, C2, or AA. So if we have that huge A limitation, the best choice here is going to be AA. The other choices may not be wrong. And sometimes when you read these questions, you have to remind yourself, especially on a specialty exam, it's a best answer. You may look at all four options and say, I think all four of these are correct. And they might be, but there's going to be one option that is better than the other three. So that's the level that we want you to know this information at. So that's the information that you need to answer this question correctly. We look at the second question and we talk about assessing impaired range of motion. What is the best assessment technique to determine this? And our answer here is the flexion rotation test. Some of these you have to be careful with because it asks the best assessment. You may have a different thought about what the best assessment is, or, or you may have a certain assessment that works really well in your hands. These questions are based on evidence. So this answer comes from a, a clinical practice guideline. So you need to know the clinical practice guidelines and maybe there's something you do in the clinic that doesn't jive with the cl clinical practice guidelines because of the patient that's sitting in front of you. So unless you're given that really specific information, that's how you wanna think about these answers. So the flexion rotation test has the best evidence behind it in terms of giving us information about the rotation um, impairment that we have here. And the other examples, we have a muscle length test, levator scap, which is not really going to get into the rotational piece. We have the cranial cervical flexion test, which is more of an, a muscle endurance test. And we have sharp purser, which is more for upper cervical instability. And we don't have any reports of any of those symptoms in this scenario. So that's why flexion rotation test is the best answer. We look at our third question. We have patient stated goals here. That's why I said they're so important to, to attend to and to pay attention to. And it specifically asks us, based on this patient's goal of not feeling tired at the end of the day, what test is most appropriate to be able for us to be able to write a goal to address that? So again, there, all these tests may be appropriate for how the patient is presenting. But this question is specifically asking us, look at the patient's goal. This was the patient's goal. What test is going to give us the best information so that we can figure out what kind of goal we want to write and what assessment we might do? And if we look at this one, our correct answer is going to be neck flexor muscle endurance test. She talks about her neck feeling heavy at the end of the day. So that speaks to having decreased endurance of those of those of the musculature that supports the neck. The other test, a levator scap length test, that's a muscle length test. That's not gonna have anything to do with endurance. An ALAR test, so that's a ligament disability test, that you might be able to make a case for that, but the neck flexor endurance test is much more on point for, the, for, this, um, for this patient. And a sternocleidomastoid strength test, those muscles, we're talking about the deeper muscles of, of the cervical spine that support the head. So that SCM strength test is not really appropriate for what those patients' goals are. So like I said, some of these answers may, you may look at, and they may not look 100% incorrect to you. It'd be great if it said, what test would you do? And you had an answer like Phoenix, Arizona. And you're like, that's completely wrong. Um, we want to challenge you on this exam. So like I said, you may look at all those options, and they may be appetizing to you, but there's going to be one that is a best answer. So keep Keep that in mind. We look at the next question. Patient has longstanding headaches and pain. What's the best treatment intervention for this? These type of questions typically come from the clinical practice guidelines, if, if they exist. So when we look at these choices, we have a collar, we have intermittent cervical traction, we have manual therapy and, and strengthening, and we have medical management with rest. And the best choice here is going to be manipulative therapy with strengthening. Um, a lot of times on the exam, we try to give a little more specific treatment techniques, but for this one, that would be the best choice. Um, and, and if we review the clinical practice guideline, we will see that cervical collars are not indicated in her case. She doesn't have any history of trauma. This has been more of a longstanding problem, so that collar would not be appropriate. Same thing with traction. Traction is more indicated if we're having ridiculous type symptoms, which 
patient did not report and medical management with rest there's really no reason for that in this scenario this scenario presents as something that is more mechanical pain in nature that we are absolutely um, qualified to treat as physical therapists so Hopefully that helped. That was a review of this cervical spine scenario and, and with some insight and explanation as to information that you needed to, to answer these questions correctly. And hopefully that helped you.